On top of that, these balloons are from FWC field sampling red tide counts. Now, if you visualize something here, and they have a field samples confirming, okay, they have a high concentration of cranium burbius, you may guess, okay, there's a whole patch is cranium burbius. And with this current, you may predict for short term where they are moving. So this virtually constitutes a, a simple monitoring system. But we did not stop there. We continued this research. And here's something really new I want to show you. I talked about the gliders. Okay. Gliders not only measure surface property, they measure property at depth. Okay. And this is a profile, glider profile across a red tide bloom. We know that is a red tide bloom because of our field measurements. Okay. What I want to show you here is, you see these periodic features, right? And uh, it's, they cycle almost every day. It's a full day. The white bar is, sun, uh, is day. The black is night. Okay. You can see it rise, drop, rise, drop. It's a cycle. And what is interesting is, okay, if you look at this, a three-day cycle, you know, this is the sunrise time. So from sunrise, it rise, okay, reach the maximum at sunset. Same thing, sunrise, rise maximum sunset. And whenever there's a sunset or the light is zero, these two do not necessarily coincide. Sometimes you have overcast, okay, you have near zero light. Okay. So at this moment, the phytoplankton start to migrate downward. And this is new for the bi biologists, okay. Dinoflakes migrate vertically. And during daytime, they migrate upwards to get light. At nighttime, they migrate downwards to get nutrients. Nothing new. But what is new is this is the first time ever this is caught in the field in a synoptic scale. Okay. Previously, everybody did lab experiment in a controlled environment, so this is real. And uh, what is even more interesting is even if, you know, after millions of years, they develop this skill to get light and nutrients at different times, they cannot always get there. Okay. For example, here, at night, okay, they try to go down. But they, there's a, a, a density layer. There's a surface layer somewhere here. They could not reach the nutrient-rich bottom layer before sunrise. But then they get to upwards. So they did nothing, actually, <laughs> by doing this. But they still, every night, they, they go down. Okay. So with this, we can come other data to interpret red tides better. And here's a ground tide, a brown tide. Uh, if you live near the Gulf of Mexico, you know what this is. Okay, this is a sargassum, and uh, the two most abundant species are sargassum natans and uh, sargassum uh, fluitans here. So one square is one centimeter square, okay, the grids. So a clump of sargassum is this big. And go to the beach, you see this. So they form a, a very rich uh, ecosystem by themselves because you find crabs, shrimp, turtle, uh, fish, everything, so, which is very good. Okay. But if you have too much on your beach, it's very bad. Okay. They get rotten. They smell like a rotten egg. Uh, you got to remove those. And the residents in Texas are very familiar with this. But the residents in the Caribbean, especially in the southern, eastern Caribbean, are not. And in 2001, they started to see this. So how can we help? To make a long story short, so based on our previous algorithm work, we implemented a sargassum watch system called SOS. Okay? So what it does is it combines our customized imagery okay, in Google Earth for the entire region with the surface currents. So every day, if you're lucky, it's a cloud free, you see something, you have currents, you can do a short term prediction. And many people are using this routinely. Okay? We know this because if for any reason our system breaks down, we receive email, they ask you, what's going on with your system? <laughs> okay? But 
they are reluctant to fund this. The users are reluctant. Okay. Okay. So we can tell the imagery slicks here. You see these outliers? Each outlier is associated with a spectra like this. So we know it's elevated spectra, and uh, it can be caused by sargassum and perhaps any other floating material. But with some other information, we can tease out this is sargassum. And this is the huge, think this is 200 kilometer. This is uh, Trinidad, Gulf of Peria, in near Venezuela. Okay. So this is the sargassum monitoring system that people use very often. And on top of that, we also did research because there are many, many questions now around sargassum. The first is, wh where are they? You tell me. And how much? And just these two questions are killing people because they are small and they move fast and you have no way to trust them for the entire region. But recently, one of our students was able to do this. Okay. Uh, so basically, well, this is like uh, finding needles in the vast ocean. They are tiny. Okay. You've got to find many of them and put together to do statistics. And that's what uh, Meng Chiu did. Okay. And look at this July 2013 and July 2015. And these are the density, surface density of sargassum. And what natural plant has this interannual variability? I can't think of any. It's almost a cycle, annual cycle, right? You know, spring, summer, every year they repeat. But not this one. But what caused this? Nobody knows. And uh, perhaps Meng Chiu, after two years, may get a better answer. And uh, she's pursuing a PhD on this. Okay. So that's blooms. Water quality and large light controlling mechanism in Tampa Bay. Um, so these are three components. Dissolved matter, phytoplankton, and non-living particles, just like uh, sediments. So which one controls light absorption in this case? In the bloom. In the dry season, we see this dissolved matter controls this. In the wet season, it controls more. But when we combine with the scattering, this is just absorption. Okay? It's the absorption and the scattering all together that control light propagation to the bottom to favor seagrass growth. When we combine both, it's the phytoplankton controls this light penetration. And because of this, if they can reduce phytoplankton, they can increase light penetration. How do they uh, reduce phytoplankton? Reduce nutrient release. So there's a nutrient management plan behind this. Okay. And so what drives the phytoplankton? On top of the management, nature. Okay. And this is the May, the ANSO index, positive phase, negative phase. And this is the river flow into Tampa Bay. You see, it's almost mimic this May. So it's a remote connection, but not always. Look at this. But look at the, this chlorophyll derived from satellites. So it's uh, remotely driven by May, in addition to uh, management. Okay. So we have a lot of uh, good things based on research. We publish papers. So how do people use this? So based on this, we implemented a virtual buoy system of VBS. So what it does is just like a real buoy. Uh, you put in your area of interest, look at the dots. Every one is a buoy, a virtual. Okay? And uh, click on any one of those, you get a summary of this a suite of water quality parameters. Uh, temperature, chlorophyll, sedum, turbidity, they have value. And these values are compared against a historical norm. And if it's outlier, you color code as red, brown, you know, you have your code. And if you follow each parameter, you get a time series graph and ASCII file. This is just like a buoy. And <coughs> so if we want to extend this to many areas, these are pretty cheap. This whole thing, maybe ten, twenty thousand dollars One single buoy, think about the cost. Of course, you know, we have different focus. So we are trying to extend this to many estuaries around the Gulf first, then perhaps other areas. So with this, um, I want to put a summary. So we specialize in using optical means to study oceans, estuaries, lakes, uh, through using field lab measurements, modeling, algorithm development, and remote sensing. 
and educating students. Actually, these are only a small part of what we do because of time limit. And we have a lot of good students. And for example, Shaolin has been able to produce the first ever Eastern Gulf surface PCO2 maps, time series, by combining different parameters. And Jackie Long combined a field lab and a remote sensing technique to characterize the white events of Everglades. And Brian Barnes recently has a paper to look at the South China Sea island building. That's political. Okay. So lots of things. So after all, um, this whole thing is centered around light. Okay. Remember, what does that famous book say? Let there be light. <laughs> right? <laughs> light.